Was Tangela your favorite Pokemon as a kid? Considering that it's a single stage Pokemon obtained late into the game and not particularly intimidating or cute, I'm willing to bet that it wasn't. Worst of all is that this tangled mess of vines or spaghetti or something has a completely awful learn set. I think today's playthrough is going to be really tough. Tough as rock, that is. Get it? Because Brock. I'm predicting that Tangela is going to get one of the worst times of all Generation 1 Pokemon against him. Constrict until level 24 is just horrible. After we make it past the rock solid Pokemon trainer with likely Constrict and Bind, Mega Drain is going to be the best go to stab move throughout most of the game. And while Tangela does get Solar Beam, that takes an entire turn to power up. So considering this terrible move set, I was actually truly stunned when I looked at its stats. This little spaghetti monster with silly shoes has 110 base special and 115 base defense, making it a tank that can output some serious damage with the few special attacks it learns. But I don't want to sugarcoat this. I really want everyone to feel the pain that is Tangela's early game experience. All I've got is Constrict. The first fight against the rival is all you need to see and understand how awful this move truly is. Why only Constrict, Game Freak? Like, I get that Tangela is a bunch of vines, but maybe give it Vine Whip? In Red and Blue, Tangela also gets Bind as a starting move, which is really great because Bind can end up dealing 5 turns of damage instead of just 1 like Constrict. But in Yellow, Game Freak decided that Tangela just didn't deserve 2 starting moves, and took away Bind until level 24. Luckily, they did end up giving it Vine Whip, but that comes much later on. It's a nice addition, but way too late to make the early game fun. With Constrict, the entire early game is a slog. This is the first time it was genuinely challenging to defeat the level 3-4 Pokemon on Route 1. While Tangela has good defense, its low attack stat doesn't let it deal more than 1 or 2 damage per turn. My experience playing with Alakazam has taught me how to train awful early game Pokemon in yellow though, so after delivering Oak's Parcel, I head back to the Mart and buy as many potions as possible. With these, I can deplete all of Constrict's power points and use Struggle. Things are very dire when you have an attacking move, but Struggle is the better choice. While I was grinding away, I reflected on Tangela's limited TM and HM learn set. Swords Dance, Body Slam, Hyper Beam, Mega Drain, and Solar Beam are the standouts, and I suspect that most of those are going to see a lot of use in this playthrough. So as I'm just getting into the double digit levels, I start to question if this challenge was a good idea. Remember how Alakazam started out with no attacking moves? This vine monster somehow feels significantly worse. I deal so little damage, even when I'm overleveled, and that makes me scared to even face the trainers in Viridian Forest. I spent as much time as possible leveling up on wild Pokemon before I actually face some of these trainers. There's no way to get past Brock at a low level, so I'll fight all of them to get the maximum experience and money possible. By the way, in my Alakazam vs Gengar video, I forgot a lass in the forest. She's over here, so that's a bit of extra cash for potions. So let's again reflect on how bad this is. I'm over half an hour in and I'm just starting to make it to the junior trainer in Brock's gym. Even at my current level with a massive defense stat, I'm still taking 2 damage from each hit. This doesn't seem like a lot, but I'll only be able to do 1 damage at a time to Brock's Pokemon. The only other options are leveling up to gain enough health to allow me to outlast both of his Pokemon, or reach level 24 when Bind increases my overall PP and lets Tangela deal more than 1 damage per attack. Because of the damage that the junior trainer was able to deal to Tangela, I level up a bit more before I try Brock for the first time at level 17. Let's see how far off I am. The first fight does not inspire confidence. Geodude just pummels Tangela too hard with its stone fists. I'm taking 2 damage each turn, and I don't even manage to get to the Onyx before I faint. I haven't mentioned it yet, but Tangela is part of the medium fast experience group, but it feels like the painfully slow experience group right now. There is nothing about this that feels fast. Just to make things more interesting, I decided to fight Brock after each level up. It gives me a better sense of how close I am, and gives my mind a break from the awful grind. Because Tangela only has 55 base speed, it doesn't get critical hits often, and that makes the fight against Brock very predictable. As my level increases, my performance against the rock solid Pokemon trainers Onyx slowly improves. Even starting out at 69 hit points, Tangela just isn't strong enough to defeat Brock yet. So is Bind required in order to get past him? This is the question that was on my mind this entire time. I kept coming back, losing again and again. 
but at level 23, only one level away from Bind, Tangela starts to struggle against Onyx. There isn't much other to say about this fight because I don't have any choice of moves, but I was genuinely tense here. I watched in disbelief as Tangela took the Onyx down, surviving with only 4 hit points. So, the Silly Shoe Vine Monster finally did it. A gym leader that should have been easy due to typing took an hour and 15 minutes to defeat. This is the worst start that I've ever had in Kanto. Tangela, you're basically the Generation 1 Reggie Gigas. You'd think that things would speed up from here. I'm level 23 after all. However, I still can't do much damage. Constrict is quite frankly one of the worst damage dealing moves in the entire game. I hate this move. Sand Attack is the worst move to face off against in a solo playthrough, but Constrict is definitely one of the worst to have to use. Luckily for me, I don't think that I'll ever have to do a run that's this bad again. Oh wait, Ditto still exists, and that might be much worse. The next section of the game allows me to buff up my Pokemon's moveset a lot with some new special moves, Absorb and Vine Whip. With my new Grass-type arsenal, Misty is easy. On the SSN, I continue to improve my moveset with the addition of Body Slam. Funnily enough, for Tangela, I think this is going to be the go-to move for most of the game. I'll explain why in a little bit. Surge isn't a challenge at all. I've got incredible defensive bulk, so I'll take very little damage from Mega Punch and Mega Kick. Additionally, Grass-type Pokemon resist electric attacks. So there isn't anything to fear in this fight. Honestly, Surge is never a challenge. Sometimes he comes down to luck, but today he's not an issue at all. I avoided healing in Vermilion City's Pokemon Center, so I dig back to Cerulean, and now I'm ready for the journey through Rock Tunnel. Usually in here I need to watch out for the Slowpoke, the status conditions from the Lass, and then the Hiker with the three Pokemon that know self-destruct. But today, Tangela has answers for all of them. In Celadon, I take some time to run some errands. I pick up Super Repels, a Fresh Water, and the TM for Fly. Tangela unfortunately doesn't get access to any of the free TMs at this portion of the game. I've been spoiled by the other Pokemon I've been doing runs with. Uh, the luxury of moves like Rock Slide, Ice Beam, and Psychic at this point are really great. But Tangela has to defeat Erika in order to get access to its most useful TM move from this section of the game. She opens with Tangela. Oh hey Silly Shoes, it's your doppelganger. It's time to prove to Erika who has the better Vine monster. My first Body Slam is a critical hit, but it also causes paralysis and prevents Erika's first turn. Second turn, I take Tangela into orange hit points, and then it uses Bind. Good choice, Erica. At least you didn't use Constrict. And then she does it. She makes poor Tangela use Constrict. Erica, you're really awful. We all know how bad this move is, but you don't seem to have gotten the message yet. I knock her Tangela out, and Weeping Bell is next. Body Slam does just under half damage, and then Acid hits for super effective damage. It gets another turn of this, and that takes Tangela down to 33 hit points before Gloom comes out. I'm not liking the looks of this. I get a critical hit against the smelly flower, and it becomes paralyzed. And then it uses acid. And Tangela survives with 4 hit points, and finishes the fight. After this tense battle, I get access to the TM for Mega Drain. This is going to be my go-to stab move, as well as my primary form of recovery. If I can avoid rest, I will. Before I head south to complete the Safari Zone and Koga, I'm going to finish off the entire Rocket plotline. There are two reasons that this is a good choice for Tangela. One, I get access to the overpowered Swords Dance in Sylph. Two, Koga and Sabrina are both significant level jumps above Erika, so I need to put in some time training. Unfortunately for our Silly Shoes, Pokemon Tower isn't a great place to grind. Grass moves are resisted by the Ghastly line, and I don't have any other damage dealing alternatives against them. At this point, I started to get worried for Agatha. I'll have to get past her with only grass moves alone. After completing Pokemon Tower, I'm off to Sylph. I hightail it towards Swords Dance. With this move on my side, I'm going to be able to do more damage with Body Slam than with Mega Drain. But why does this mysterious Vine monster with Silly Shoes even learn Swords Dance in the first place? It's obviously not a physical attacker, and I can't really see this thing doing a Kabutops-style jig while staring the opponent down. If Tangela tried that, I think that the enemy would just laugh. The unfortunate thing about Sylph is that I can usually level up here to be prepared for the late game, but because of Tangela's typing, it isn't well equipped to defeat the rocket's poison types. To level up a bit more, I head over to the fighting dojo, and honestly Tangela is prepared for this place. It can use its silly shoes as boxing gloves for a bit of extra damage, and all these trainers are easy to defeat. After that, I head back to Sylph, and training in here is manageable now. I have to heal regularly, and if this was a versus video, I would have been very stressed by all the time that I waste walking back and forth between the healer and the trainers. 
However, today I get the luxury of a solo playthrough. And with the abysmal Brock split behind me, Tangela's time isn't going to be impressive anyways. The Sylph Rival opens with Sandslash, and this is really convenient for me. Because it knows Poison Sting, it's just going to spam this over and over, and give Tangela as much time as it wants to set up Swords Dance. With the Jig out of the way, I start to use Mega Drain and heal the damage that I've sustained. The reason I set up here is not for the badge boost glitch though, it's for the actual attack raise that Swords Dance gives. It's useful against Magneton, Ninetales, and Kadabra. I one shot all of them because this goofy tangled mess is now just incredibly strong. Vaporeon is last and I figured that a Mega Drain would be a great choice, but it turns out that Body Slam would actually have been better. Vaporeon just has too much special for Tangela to do significant damage. With this fight out of the way, I was a bit worried about the Rockets and Giovanni. However, they're really weak so Tangela just makes quick work of them. Normally this is the last time that Giovanni is easy, but I think that he's going to be even easier in the final gym fight. Next, I decide to go for Sabrina before Koga. I'm here in Saffron anyways, and access to Body Slam and Swords Dance is going to make all of her frail psychic types easy to knock out. Abra is first and it's the only Pokemon on her team that can mess me up, but Flash fails and then Tangela puts it to sleep. With it asleep, I can set up Swords Dance without my accuracy being lowered. Body Slam takes the Abra out and Kadabra is next. Sabrina uses an X Defend and despite the defensive buff, Swords Dance is just too powerful again. Alakazam is last. It uses Psy Wave. This move can deal between 1 damage and 1.5 times the user's level in damage. So the maximum it could have done would have been 75, and this hit did 70, so that's almost maximum damage. But today that's not enough for Sabrina, and with her finished off I can move on to the rest of the playthrough. In the next gym, Tangela gets the opportunity to learn growth. This was a tough choice for me. In Generation 1, Special Attack and Special Defense are combined into a single special stat, so using Growth is going to buff both Tangela's offensive and defensive abilities. It's also worth noting that most of the League has strong Special Attackers, so the boost in Special will be very helpful. In the end, I decided to remove Sleep Powder and get access to Growth. Stat altering moves in Generation 1 are just too powerful. Also, because of Tangela's speed and defensive bulk, I don't think that Sleep Powder is going to be as pivotal as it was with a Pokemon like Butterfree. Koga opens with Venonat and it poisons me right away as I begin to set up with Swords Dance. This is the ideal opening for this fight because then his Pokemon can't put me to sleep anymore. After three turns of setup, I begin my sweep through the weak bug poison types. His ace Venomoth comes out and this fire type could be scary if I don't KO it, but Tangela gets the job done with Body Slam. This move should probably be renamed with Tangela. More like Shoe Punch or Spaghetti Slam. Mm, what about Body Spaghetti? Mm, something like that. Okay, let's move on. Up next is Blaine, whose fire types are going to be tricky for Tangela to manage. In preparation, I use all the vitamins in Pokemon Mansion. I also pick up TM22, which is Solar Beam. I'm not going to teach it to Tangela right away, I'll need it for later. I want to keep Body Slam, Growth, Mega Drain, and Swords Dance on my move set as long as possible. Both of these setup moves are great, and Mega Drain gives me access to recovery. Blaine opens with Ninetales. I immediately go for Growth to improve my chances of surviving super effective fire moves. Ninetales toys with me a bit using Quick Attack and Confuse Ray, and then it eventually uses Flamethrower, and it one hits Tangela due to a critical hit. Great. Critical hits bypass stat changes, so all my growths did nothing. Without a critical hit, I should have survived that. Let's try Swords Dance instead. Maybe I can take Ninetales out quickly and then set up against the Rapidash because it has a lower special stat. I try using two turns of Swords Dance into Body Slam, but Ninetales survives the hit and uses Flamethrower. Another critical hit. Ugh, this is really not going well for me. On the third fight, you can tell that I'm not really sure what to do. I test Body Slam first to see how much damage it's doing. That doesn't work, so I use Swords Dance to improve my damage for the second Body Slam but it still doesn't KO the Ninetales. However, Blaine remembers his red and blue days and uses his signature super potion, giving me another turn to finish off the Fire Fox. Rapidash gives Tangela an opportunity to complete two more turns of Swords Dance, making the Flaming Horse an easy one-shot. I took a lot of damage there. I'm not sure that I'll survive a hit from Arcanine though. I outspeed likely due to the badge boost glitch, and I take Arcanine down to orange health. It uses Takedown and Tangela survives with seven hit points. I did it. I'm past Blaine after only three attempts. Tangela is a bit underleveled at this point, and Giovanni's gym is a decent place to earn some experience before the league. After this there's only Victory Road, and I typically don't like to train there. 
I prefer training against trainers, and if I fight the trainers in Victory Road, I have to constantly use super repels. Giovanni's team is so much better in yellow than it is in red and blue. He's got Earthquake on four of his Pokemon, as well as powerful coverage moves like Thunder. While on vacation this week, I played Pokemon Monopoly with my girlfriend and my parents. She immediately landed on both Nidoqueen and Nidoking, which are the properties that replace Park Place and Boardwalk. So yeah, she won. It was a dark moment losing my money to the hotel on her tangle of space, but it was an even darker moment losing all of my money and the game to her Nidoking. At least my Tangela had an easy victory against Giovanni's Nidoking here today. Up next is the final rival. Sandslash is an opportunity to set up growth. Mega Drain heals the damage it did to me, and then I set up Sword Stance on Execute. After that, it's time to sweep. Even after the badge boost glitch gets reset after a level up in the middle of the fight, I am still able to take the victory. You'll probably have mentioned in the comments already about how I should have given him Flareon. Well, thanks for helping with the YouTube algorithm. But I actually forgot how the early game fights with the rival determine what he gets. I know that Jolteon is after two victories for the player, but I thought that Flareon was a loss in the lab and then skipping the optional battle. And I didn't check Bulbapedia, because I actually didn't have internet on vacation, so whoops. Here's my moveset when I arrived at the league. I'm feeling pretty good about most of these fights, with the notable exception of Agatha. I really hope that Growth is going to give my grass moves the boost that they need in order to finish off her poison type ghosts. Lorelai is my first challenge, and despite her super effective ice moves, her Pokemon don't resist Mega Drain, and after setup with Growth, I heal myself completely on Dugong. The Cloister and the Slowbro are simple one hits after that. Jinx is next. It outspeeds with Ice Punch, and oh my, that did so much damage due to a critical hit. Body Slam deals around one third damage, and then the Strange Ice type knocks me out. On the next fight, I take the opportunity at Slowbro to set up Sword Stance. It can't do super effective damage to Tangela, and it also can't freeze us. I take it out with Mega Drain and heal completely. Now it's time for Jinx. So it still outspeeds and gets another critical hit. But with Swords Dance, Tangela's shoes are now punching gloves, and it knocks Jinx out in a single hit. Lapras is last, but it outspeeds and finishes the fight with Blizzard. I tried one more time, but Jinx immediately froze Tangela. You can't unthaw without a fire move in Generation 1, so that's it, I've got a reset. This fight just isn't working. I realized at this point that I forgot Mimic, and I want it for Lance anyways, so I'll head back and pick that up now. Sometimes I find it good to clear my head and come back to the fight after doing something else. When I return to face Lorelei again, I decide to just set up everything against Dugong. So that's clearly not the best way to do it, but I'm able to sweep through her team and arrive at Jinx anyways. Okay, please let Ice Punch not get a critical hit. Oh, oh, it got a critical hit. Great. Body Slam finishes it off and Lapras is next. This time I outspeed it because apparently we're speed tied, and Mega Drain heals Tangela up to orange health. Then Lapras uses Blizzard. Oh, but Tangela survives and finishes it off next turn. Then between Lorelei and Agatha, there's just this strange hiker that somehow got in here. He's got some fighting Pokemon and rock Pokemon. Whatever, I take him out fairly quickly and then I'm moving on to the real threat, Agatha, the second member of the Elite Four. She's the trainer I've been dreading the most. At this time, Sword Stance isn't really helpful, and I need more PP on special moves in order to damage her ghost Pokemon. So I replace Sword Stance with Solar Beam and use my PP ups divided between it and Mega Drain. Now it's time. Against the first Gengar, I need to do all my setup. It knows Lick, Mega Drain, Confuse Ray, and Substitute, so it's not a threat against Tangela. I want to be able to do as much damage as possible against the ghosts that know Dream Eater when they come out. With full setup, Solar Beam is capable of breaking Gengar's Substitute in a single hit. Okay, that's really encouraging. She switches into Golbat, and I use Body Slam to preserve PP on my grass moves for the ghosts. Leech Life is super effective, but it doesn't do much damage. Good thing the Golbat didn't use Wing Attack. Gengar comes back out, and I finish it off with a critical hit from Solar Beam. Haunter is next, and it puts Tangela to sleep and uses Dream Eater. Though, thanks to all my setup, I'm taking these hits really well. Solar Beam is doing good damage too. It one-shots Arbok, and then I use Mega Drain to heal up with Haunter's HP before the final Gengar. I'm paralyzed for this fight, so it can't put me to sleep. That's actually an advantage. When Solar Beam hits, it finishes the powerful Ghost off in a single hit. I am so surprised. I defeated Agatha on my first fight against her. I really thought that she was going to be one of the hardest and most annoying trainers in this playthrough. 
Mimic replaces Solar Beam for Lance. Against Gyarados, I can set up a bit with Growth, and then use Mega Drain to heal the damage that it's dealt to this point. The first Dragonair isn't a threat because Lance's AI is going to prevent it from choosing Thunder Wave. That's a big advantage because Paralysis could mess Tangela up against Aerodactyl. The second Dragonair is my chance to steal Ice Beam, but this comes with the 10% risk of it freezing me. It doesn't, and I use the stolen move to knock it out. Aerodactyl is next. It outspeeds and uses Fly, which gets a critical hit and knocks Tangela out in a single hit. It's going to get a critical hit 25% of the time due to its base speed, but it could also use Wing Attack, which I have a better shot of surviving. On the second fight, I arrive at Aerodactyl with orange health, and unfortunately this isn't enough to survive a critical hit from Wing Attack. I'll need to arrive here with green health I think. In the third fight, I attempt to do this by using Mega Drain against the second Dragonair, but unfortunately I don't heal into green health. Aerodactyl comes out and uses Wing Attack, first turn. And oh my, Tangela survived the critical hit with two hit points. Ice Beam takes the prehistoric not dragon out. This is so tense. Will the vine monster outspeed the dragon? It does, and Dragonite faints from Ice Beam. It's champion time, the final Kanto challenge for Tangela. I set up against the Sand Slash because it's going to constantly spam Poison Sting. I knock it out, and through doing so, I heal with Mega Drain. Alakazam is next. Body Slam doesn't knock it out in a single hit, but my special attack stat lets me tank the Psychic like a boss. The Silly Shoes clearly have anti-Psychic powers. Executor is a slog because I have to knock it out with Body Slam. It faints and then Ninetales comes out. At this point I realize that perhaps Butt's team with Flareon would have been an easier battle. Because in that case he doesn't have Ninetales. Here it can outspeed me and lock me into the multi-turn fire spin. With poison damage added into the mix, Tangela faints. On my second fight against him, I get back to the Ninetales without poison, but Fire Spin is still too much for Tangela to deal with. On the third fight, I use Mimic to steal Slash. I wondered if this would help me deal more damage to Alakazam and Executor, and preserve power points for the rest of the fight. By the way, I've recently realized that I can say power points instead of PP, but then where would we be without all the innuendos and third grade humor? I think I'll have to keep saying PP in the future. So this isn't working against the Ninetales. It's time to go back to my tried and true signature move. Rest is just so great because it allows for predictable recovery and also heals status conditions. In this case it lets me remove poison from earlier in the fight and adds consistency if Alakazam uses Kinesis. Lucky for me it didn't in this fight. Paralysis and a lucky critical hit speed up my progress against Executor. Ninetales is next and it's starting to feel hopeless here again because it's got me trapped in fire spin but then it misses, and Tangela hits it and it paralyzes. Because of this, it can't move and Tangela makes it to Magneton for the first time. I use Mega Drain here to recover health. Vaporeon is last. Mega Drain doesn't knock it out, but Butt uses a full restore. My second attack gets a better range, but it still isn't enough, and Vaporeon knows two ice moves. However, this time it selects Mist, and that allows Tangela to knock it out. 2 hours, 53 minutes, and 56 seconds. This is undoubtedly my slowest playthrough of Kanto in recent memory. If only this Vine monster was given Vine Whip at the start. In that case, it probably would have got a time that was over an hour faster than this. Even despite its incredibly slow start, which is sort of Reggie Gigas tier, it did pretty well with the game. Access to Growth, Swords Dance, Mega Drain, and Body Slam make this little Vine mess a great choice for Generation 1. And that's especially the case if you're adding it to your team after Brock. I've been doing a lot of Versus videos in Kanto lately, and it was really fun to do a solo playthrough again. Unfortunately for me, in my real life, I've had a sewage backup this week, and solving this emergency issue has consumed most of my time. So I'm feeling that I want to make some lemonade out of the lemons that life has given me, so stay tuned for a Grimer run in the near future. Like, subscribe, and ring the chime echo for more. I treat my comments with a gotta read them all mentality, so leave your thoughts down below. Finally, if you want to go above and beyond in supporting this content, consider joining my Patreon. You'll get access to ad-free videos, access to our Discord channel, and a spot in this super cool credit sequence. But money isn't everything. The most important thing is that you're just here watching. If you've made it this far, you're incredible. And now it's time for bloopers. Recording audio is hard, but at least we can laugh at a few of my mistakes together. I'll see you in my next video. I don't think that sleep powder is going to be as pivotal as pivotable. Oh my gosh. Ah. Okay. I don't think that sleep powder is going to be as pivotal as pivotable. No, I did it again.
Ah! Okay. Koga opens with Venonat, and it poisons me right up. Uh, poisons me. Ah, I can't say anything. It's a. Uh, it's my curse. Whenever I mention uh, the Venonat or Venomoth line, I just have to say something wrong. His Ace Venomoth comes out, and this fire type could be scary if I don't KO it. But Tangela gets the job done with Boy. With Boydy Slam. Boydy Slam. Ah! Booty Slam. Okay, here we go. Blaine remembers his red and blue days and uses his signature super potion, giving me another turn to finish off the fire doggo. Is is it a dog or is it a cat? Like, I'm not really sure what is it a fox? I think it's a fox. There's just like a burp in my throat right now because I just ate food and it's just teasing me. It's like, hey, I'm not gonna come up if the take is bad, but if it's a good take, I'm gonna come up and ruin it. I know that's what's gonna happen. Okay. I gotta do the next one now. I gotta eventually go for it because it's just not coming up. Okay, stay down, burp. Like, subscribe, and ring my Chimeco for more. Not my Chimeco, the Chimeco.